announcements they've made, and I'm going today to sort of take and position myself down here and speak candidly to you guys, okay? I'm going to invite you all to listen, but this is, this is an opportunity for me, hopefully, to be able to find some kind of way to encourage you, and that's, that's really my goal this morning, and I'm just going to let the guy, other folks listen. What I do know is that as I told the first service, as I positioned myself down front, I told the first service this morning that they're all youth. We're going to be talking about youth today. And I said, I told the first service, if you're 112 or less, you're youth. (laughs) So that probably applies to most of us today. And so maybe as we talk specifically to you guys, maybe we can have an opportunity. They can glean some things as well that I think will be applicable for their lives And hopefully we can do that together this morning. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage all of us to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be talking with one verse today, a very familiar verse, at a season like this, at a time in a like like this that we would have. While you're finding your Bible, let me mention to you a couple, uh, at least one more thing that we're doing uh, uh, as we're moving, sort of transitioning a little bit in our church family to doing some uh, uh, different kinds of things. We're working on developing a mentoring program. You've sort of heard us talk about that over the last several weeks, and uh, that's beginning to launch. You'll hear more about that on a public level as this year sort of wraps up, and we're looking forward to doing some, some things as a church family toward that end. The second thing we're doing is we've made a a greater commitment this year to prayer. Uh, you've already sp- in, been invited twice to be able to spend time in fasting and prayer for the last, uh, this, this year. And in and, and about three weeks, I think it is, our uh, Lori Heverly will actually be able to introduce to you uh, one of the things uh, that they're actually beginning to do, a, sort of an initiative called Wells of Living Water, uh, inviting us to be able to participate in a, in, a, in a church-wide journey of prayer. We really believe that God is uh, doing a neat work in our church family, and I believe in large part it's, due, it's because of prayer. We're seeing some God do some neat things in our lives, and we appreciate that. And we're going to invite you to participate with us, and you'll hear more about this in two or three weeks, but just giving you a little heads up of, of things that are to come, and, and I look forward to uh, sharing in that opportunity with you today. First Timothy chapter 4 Verse 12 says to us simply this. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It simply said this. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all leaders in what you say and you, in what you live and in your love and your faith and your purity. So this morning, we're just going to have some family time this morning. So this is our opportunity to spend some time together today. And I'm going to invite the church to sort of listen in if that's okay. All right. The reason I want to come to this passage, the reason why I think this passage is really critical for us and for our time together today is a couple of things. And if you have your notes with us this morning, we will be following along and you'll be seeing those displayed on the screen. As Paul is writing to young Timothy, uh, he's writing a verse that really has been a source of encouragement to not only young people, but to young people of 112 years of age and younger for many, many years. And I think for a couple of reasons. The first has to do with this, because there's a universal struggle with personal identity. It begins with knowing who we are. In our culture today, we find uh, a lot of things that's trying to find a way. We, we oftentimes, even with social kinds of education, so try to build self-esteem, try to find ways to build within you guys a, a better feeling about yourself. But, but the reality is our identity is really diminishing. Our understanding of who we are is greatly diminishing, and we're seeing it lived out in so many ways. What we do know is this, that when somebody lacks a sense of identity or confidence in who they are, they often find themselves feeling incompetent at times. I just don't measure up. Maybe unloved, or maybe just simply inadequate. I don't even even have what it takes. Sometimes the the word that all comes in our life is the inner voice. I don't know if you've ever, y'all ever talked to yourself at all? You ever stand in the mirror and just sort of talk to yourself and Andy said, man, this is a good looking guy. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. I don't know what you might say in the, in, the, in the mirror, you know, but sometimes we talk to ourselves. As an adult, you may hear people some say something like this. It's okay to talk to yourself, but if you ask yourself questions, you have a real problem when you start answering your own questions. So anyway, I don't know what happens. I guess they call the people with the white suits to come pick us up at that point in time. I'm not real sure. But the inner voice, that, that place in our mind that we oftentimes sort of sometimes 
go to. Uh, when we find ourselves sort of feeling bad, sometimes we go to the inner voice to sort of, we can get through this, sort of to talk ourselves up to be able to make ourselves better. But that inner voice oftentimes becomes sort of a negative source as well. Maybe it comes sort of like this, as we sometimes sort of feel inadequate, and if we're not careful, we'll talk ourselves into the inadequacy. It's the place in our life that, that we find ourselves sometimes getting to a place where we, we sort of uh, struggle with ourselves, and because we struggle with ourselves, we lash out against other people. You've heard this statement, hurt people, hurt people. Sometimes that's what's happening. On the inside, if we're hurting, sometimes we lash out because, again, on this inner self, we're trying to find peace of that. And in reality, it lives out in so many kinds of social aspects, such as depression and anxiety, and, and we're seeing living, living out anorexia and bulimia and so many other disorders that we would see that you probably have seen some in your school life as well. I don't know whether self-hurt is still a reality as much today as it was in at least a few years ago, but I remember a few years ago there were there was a lot of time a lot of kids cutting themselves and that kind of stuff. And it and in reality, the bottom line, the reason why that's happening is because of an identity issue. At the, if you peel the onion back, it really has to do with our identity and understanding who we are. We're seeing it, it, it lived out in our culture today in maybe ways we've never seen it before as we see sort of the LBGT community sort of living out and sort of coming to a more of a fruition as we're finding gender identity becoming something that's just becoming a part of our culture today anymore. Gender, gender fluidity even, or, or I ran across somebody the other day said I'm non-binary. I literally, I literally had to go home and open up the dictionary and figure out what that was. I didn't know. And what I've discovered was it was somebody that doesn't identify, again, this, our identity doesn't identify as either male nor female. At the bottom line, it really is an identity issue for us. And, and, and that becomes critical, I, I, I really believe, as it relates to this passage, simply because, and here's the why in your notes this morning, because since Adam, Genesis chapter 3, We've all got a sin nature. And because we've got a sin nature, there is a place within where the enemy really works, has its best place to work in our lives, and it's in the mind, and our understanding of who we are, and possibly in our poor sense of identity, that's where he works best, kill, to steal, and to destroy. He's a master at it. That's why Paul would write in Philippians chapter 4, fix your mind on the things that are good and honorable and true and right and pure and lovely. He would tell her, your death and life are in the power of words. But there's also love, love in those who finds its fruits. You know, he, he, he reminds us of the necessity for us in life to be able to lean into that which is good because it's not just the voices in our heads sometimes. It also becomes the voices that are around us sometimes that erode at our identity as we sometimes are rem reminded of our inadequacy by even people around us. You realize that 70, over 70% 70 of communication is nonverbal? Yeah? So when you're in a conversation with somebody and, and, and they're sort of sitting back and you're trying to talk and they're going, oh, my goodness. Are they placing value on your conversation? You know, we find those things sometimes in life. Again, it's, it's the communication that happens with other people sometimes that actually feeds into this sense of poor sense of understanding of our value that brings us to a place where we need to, we need to understand something greater about ourselves. And I think the Apostle Paul speaks specifically to that in, to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 4.12. We also know that the environment that we live in is pretty empty of godly influence. We just don't have much. I'm grateful for uh, the Speaker of the House this past week introducing uh, the new statue of Billy Graham and actually making a big deal of that. I, I, it was a big deal. I don't know if any of you all saw that or not, but, but I'm grateful that there was at least somebody that stood up and made something big, a big deal about godly kinds of things. But for the most part, our world doesn't have much in the way of godly influence. 
And as it relates to that, we understand in the, in the scope of it all with our minds already sort of, sort of leaning to the place where we struggle with our own sense of identity, it's so easy then for us to give in to the desires of life as, Paul, as John would talk about First John 2, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, things that attract us. It's the same things that happened with Adam and Eve. It all began back in the garden. And we are today are the recipients of even that. Here's what Paul said. Let no one take you captive. In other words, let no one take your mind captive by those things that are the world's philosophy of empty deceit, of human tradition, the elemental spirits of this world. In other words, the natural tendencies within, the inquiring mind wants to know, but we need to be careful that we don't lend ourselves to that. Why or the so what is this? Because the environment that we li we're living in, here's your next point, is also underneath the influence of the enemy. So not only is there a spot already in our mind that the enemy is seeking work, the, the, the enemy is also working in the environment around us. He, we're living in, a, in the world where he's the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2, 2 and he's the God of this world in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2 Corinthians 4. And so in, comp in, in that whole idea, there's an admonition here, and I think that's what really we get to today. It's what Paul was saying to young Timothy, and I hope he speaks to you also through that. 1 Timothy 4.2 said this, Don't let anyone think less of you because of your youth. It begins with a warning. That's first point, a warning. Interestingly enough, when you go back to the original language of that passage, you're going to find the word, don't let anyone think less of you. It's actually a, a, a Greek, two Greek words put together. It's the word kata, phneo, kata and, and phneo put together in a compound word to, to, to make something, uh, uh, make a, a, a unique meaning. And it, it sim simply means to think down on someone, to despise or to treat with contempt to pass judgment on somebody or their character. In other words, to not give you the respect that you're due. Uh, that happens. You've probably been in some environment somewhere in life that you probably had somebody that didn't treat you with the respect you deserve. W would you agree with that? We probably all have had that. Most of us have, right? Huh? Okay. Most of us, some of us haven't. You've, life, life's always treated you well. Okay. Good deal. Scripture's really clear in, in, in the word regarding this whole concept of to treat someone with contempt or to treat someone with, one with despise. You know, Matthew 7 verses 1 and 2 tells us not to judge. Judge not lest you be judged. Jeff, Matthew 7 verse 5 talks to us about taking the log out of our own eyes so that we can actually see and help someone take the toothpick out of theirs. The reality is, Paul said in Romans 12, 3, these words. He said, be careful that you judge yourself not based upon what other people say about you, but you judge yourself upon the evaluation that God has placed in you. In other words, be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith that God has already given you. God's placed within your life a gift. A set of spiritual gifts, obviously. An opportunity for you to be able to, to be able to live out life. He's placed within your life a set, set of passions. And some of those passions are already beginning to be driving you towards some kind of career that you're, that you're pursuing. And, and that's, that's neat. But that whole concept and that idea is that evaluation is so often in life it's so easy for us to get into an environment where somebody says something about us and then we choose to to believe what they have to say, and we set our value of ourselves based upon what they say about us. We may have online today one, a young man watching, and I, I won't mention his name because I will respect him, but first church I served, he, he was a, just, a, just a neat young guy. He had, grew up with a Christian family. They were very active in church. They were committed to church. Oh, my goodness, it was, it was, it was the ideal family, you would think. But there were times, and oftentimes more than I would like to admit, there were times that there was a dad that was a little rough with this kid. Sometimes I've heard this dad say to this kid, ah, you'll never measure up. 
You need to step up. I knew you couldn't do it. And I kept watching this young man find himself sort of beat down and beat down and beat down because what he heard was a father who didn't believe in him. And before long, he began to believe what the father was saying about him. The neat thing about it is this young man has continued to strive. He's now, I don't know, probably close to 40 years old. He's come to a place in his life where he has finished a a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and now is finishing a doctorate degree. He is striving because somewhere along the life, there were some people that came around him that chose to demonstrate to him a higher sense of value and to pour into his life in in such a way to be able to help him to believe that he indeed was valuable before before God and God did indeed have a purpose for his life. And and one of these days, uh, I hope to be able to see him again. It's been a few years since I've seen him, but we talk probably every other week. God has a lot to say about your life. Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. John 15, 15 I no longer call you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants, but I call you now friends. You're a friend of God. Galatians 4, 6, and 7, and because we're his children, God has sent his spirit, his son, into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Daddy, I have a father. You get the privilege to call our heavenly father, Dad. And then Zephaniah 3, verse 7, I love that passage. And by the way, there is a Zephaniah in the Bible. Just, just, just to remind you, they, you know, some, I remember back in seminary, there was oftentimes those days that our, our seminary professors would say something along these lines. Preacher boys, I want you to find the book of Hezekiah chapter 3 verse 7. And you'd be surprised how many of us would be digging around. It's got to be an Old Testament somewhere. I don't know where that's at. And then we'd go revert all over to the index and all of a sudden he's looking, up, looking at us like, when are you going to, cry? When are you going to finally figure this out? Sometimes we don't know the scriptures as well, maybe, maybe as well as we should, and, even, and obviously we didn't in those days, but Zephaniah chapter 3 is a tremendous verse, and it's written to a group of people that were discouraged and defeated because of their circumstances. And this is what God said through Zephaniah to them, and I think he wants to say to you, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He takes delight in you with gladness. With his love, he'll calm you with fears, calm your fears. And with rejoice, he will sing over you. Isn't that great? God takes delight in you. We need to measure ourselves not by what others may say about us, but rather we need to measure ourselves by what God has to say about us, lest we find our personal value being diminished because of what someone else might have said. There's a second thing he means, not just a warning. Be careful that you don't judge yourself. Don't let anyone speak down to you because you're you. The challenge is he's be an example to, what does he say? Are you with me? 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Be an example to whom? To believers. All believers. Based upon translation. He doesn't say to you and I, you need to be an example to, to the, you know, what person the reader, the class on in school. He said, be a, I need you to be a, belie- a ch- example to all believers. Here's, here's what I'd like for you to know about this passage. That, that word, be an example, actually has, is, a, is a Greek word that basically, here's the literal translation of it. I've lift, I listed in your notes, put yourself together. We used to say in North Carolina, pull yourself together. Sometimes you get sort of you know, overwhelmed by the circumstances or whatever it is in life and whatever's happening, you find yourself in a position, but you just need to somehow or another get yourself together, get your act together, pull yourself together. And in this context of the passage, he says to, says to young Timothy that whatever happens happening around you, don't let people speak down to you. But in the context of whatever may be happening in life, it's time, pull yourself together. Put yourself together. Because we need to put on some things, right? I mean, Scripture says because we're children of God, we now have, we have Christ in us. He said all who've been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. Romans 13, 14 says, instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Colossians 3, we have been raised to new life with Christ, then put on the clothing, the, the garments that represent him. And he, so he says to you and I to pull ourselves together for the purpose of an audience. And the target audience that we find here this morning is our next point. The target audience is to all believers. The challenge is for us to be an example at a higher level. It's one thing for us to look at the first kid in class and outperform him. But it's another thing for us to find the best kid in class and choose to be an example to that one. And that's exactly what he's asking us to do. He's asking us not to find the least denominator, but the highest denominator. You know, we typically sort of, sort of navigate, sort of migrate to whatever the least expectation is in our life. And Paul is challenging the apostle young Timothy to rise to the occasion, to be a testimony to those who are the best around you. You know, uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll wrote a book many years ago that, uh, that talked about living above the level of mediocrity. And he talks about mediocrity being sort of the, the nectar of our world. It's, it's sort of the thing that we're all drawn toward is just getting by. And his challenge to us as believers is that ought, to be, that ought not to be our status. That ought not to be our target, our goal. It needs to be better than that. And that's why Paul tells, tells young Timothy that our audience has to do with the best of the best. Be an example to those who've risen above us. Find yourself a position where that you live out faith before them so that we don't find the least of the people to live out faith before, but the best of the people. And then he gives us this two classifications, I guess, if it were. If you were to take this list of five things that he's talked about as he wraps up this passage that we're, we're to be an example to these believers in the way we live and the way we speak, being the one, first one, and then the last one in, 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 in love and faith and purity. The first has to do with, I'll, I'll use the word external conformity. Just being externally Right. When we when we look at somebody, we go measure, we get to know somebody, we we get to know them based upon either what they say, what they do. That's all we can measure, that's all we can see. You know, we may look at other classifications like how they're dressed and those kind of things that we may some judge it with. But as a, as a general rule, when we look at the character of an individual, we basically the first thing that we can see and judge is basically what they say and what they do. And in reality, he's talking about this external conformity because we all have an opportunity in life to be able to, to display some things externally. Uh, and we have an opportunity and responsibility to be able to do that. We should live as Christ lived according to 1 John 2.6. 1 Peter 2.21, God called you to do good even when it means suffering. Titus 3, remind the believers to, to submit themselves to governments. And there was a whole list of things. And, I, and, I, and I, 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 as, I was, as I was sort of putting this together and as I was thinking through this, we had the opportunity on uh, Friday, Karen and I did, to go visit a precious young lady in our, in our church. Her name's Millie Kimbrell. And Millie went to home with the be the Lord on Saturday morning early. And Karen and I had an opportunity to visit with the family, sweet, sweet visit with the family. And uh, while we were there, another precious lady that most many of us are familiar with named Joy Sims came in while we were there. You know, Joy has a way, if y'all know, y'all know Joy, Joy has a way when she walks into a room, she just, I mean, it just elevates. It just, it just does. She just has that natural tendency with her. When, when Joy came in, she began talking and telling her stories that she did. And, but one of the stories seemed like an odd story. I'm thinking, why in the world is she telling us this story? You know, Millie's sort of in her last moments of life and family's gathering, trying to grieve. And then she's telling us a story about her, her childbirth, childhood. I thought, okay, well, that's okay. It's joy. We'll, we'll listen. It's worth listening to. And she told, me, told us about how when she was raised that she was not raised in a Christian home. And uh, she didn't have the influence of Christianity in the home in which she lived, but the influence that she had was one that still elevated some very basic Christian principles. Her mom, though not a believer, at the moment found herself basically challenging her. She, and as I read Titus 3, I reminded her of that. She, she said, in our home, no one in our home would have ever spoken poorly about the president. 
whether you voted for him or not. Because there was a level of respect that was demanded in our home for the, for the person who is in authority over us. And I thought, that fits. That under, I understand that. But even from an unbelieving world, we can speak and act rightly. As a matter of fact, some of us know people who are not believers that speak and act better than some people who are believers. And that's, that's, just, that's just the way things are. And the reality is that we find ourselves in this life sometimes being called to that. And yet Paul tells young Timothy, even in your life, conform yourself externally, speak and act as if you are part of God's family. And the last statement he makes here, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, has to do with internal transformation, internal transformation in your love and your, your purity. There's one thing in our lives we can't see. You can't see the inside. We can, we can take x-rays of your body. You can take an MRI of your body and maybe an ultrasound. You can find some pieces about it, but you can't look down in the soul of an individual. You can't find it. You can't find the depths of an individual where the rubber meets the road. And Paul challenges young Timothy, and he says to young Timothy that even in times of your life when people may speak contempt to you, don't receive it. Find a way within to be an example to everyone of what you ought to say and what you ought to do, but also internally of how you respond in love and in faith and in purity. You know, one of the things we'll never be able to know, it's, you know, we've been commanded as Christians to love each other, right? Right? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a command for us. And the reality is every one of us could say, there's a lot of people in life that's easy to love, right? You and I might be able to name one or two that's a little bit difficult to love, right? Maybe, maybe not. You've got, you've got better friends. Maybe, I don't know, but anyway. But there's probably times that we find ourselves in those positions in life that we find it a little difficult to love someone, but... Where in Scripture do you ever find an excuse for not loving? There's not. So God calls us to love, period. God also calls us to faith, period. And when life is tough, it's, that's when our faith is, steps up. That's when our faith is called upon to be able to do things and act and respond in ways that otherwise we could not have done apart from faith and then in purity. You know, nobody looks inside the heart and knows what's going on inside the mind. But God goes everywhere with you. He sees everything with you. And the Apostle Paul challenges young Timothy not only be an example to the world, to the watching world, but to the church and the watching church to the best of the best in the way you live your life and the way you speak, but also be an example in the recesses of your heart in the way you love and the way you demonstrate faith and the way that you live out your life in purity. So let's make some application quickly and I'll quit. Number one is this, who you are is critically important. Who you are is critically important, but only God will help you to be able to fully understand his design for you. I think in most of the times I've generally written a note to some of our graduates somewhere along the way and maybe a word of encouragement, I've always challenged them to keep their heart open to God. Keep their eyes focused upon him. Because that's the, that's the easy thing for us to do is to get distracted. Things happen. Life happens. You know, we get busy. Everything happens and we begin to withdraw. And before long, what really happens is our identity begins to lose foundation. 
And when we begin to lose the foundation of our identity, then all the rest of the things of this world begins to have an easy access into the place where the enemy works best in our mind. Third, secondly, never stop learning. I know you're saying, I am done with school, done, 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 done. I'm selling it D-U-N for, forever. It's not the way you spell it, by the way. I just thought I'd add. But never stop learning. It may not necessarily that you'll be in a classroom setting the rest of your life, but fi- make sure you're a student. There'll, be never, there'll never be a day that you'll learn everything it is about this book. I've read it many, many times, and I promise you this. There are often times I pick it up and I see something I've never seen before. And it has nothing to do that I didn't read the words before, but it didn't have meaning before. But today it has meaning. Never stop learning. And that's critical because of this last statement, and that's this. Be diligent to keep Christ central in your life and in your family. Because there will come a day in your life, I promise you, where inner strength is needed. We grew up, I grew up on a farm in North Carolina. There's a little place called Capella, North Carolina. Anybody heard of Capella, North Carolina? I have yet found Have you? Oh, my goodness, there's the first person I've ever asked. You've heard that too? Well, look, glory. There's two. Capeller's not even a crossroads. We had a little farm up in Capeller, North Carolina. That We had two important places. We had an old house that was there. My, it was my grandfather and grandmother's house. And, and uh, on the outside of the house, there were two important fixtures. One was the outhouse. <laughs> we'll not talk about that. You can figure that out later, and if you haven't seen one of those before, ask your mom and dad. They'll talk about it, maybe, or grandparents, maybe. But the second one was a well. It was an old well that we, we, we would wind a rope down, and the bucket would go down to the bottom, and, and it would dr- drain water, some of the best-tasting water you ever had in your life. But I'll never forget one year when we wound that r- rope down, and when it hit it hit rock rather than water because there was no water in the well to draw from. And my challenge to you this, never stop learning, never keep, never let a day in your life go without Christ being central because there will come a time that you're going to need water from the well and if you've not invested it there, it won't be there for you. And that's my challenge for you today. I'm going to ask you if you would to do one more thing for me before we actually dismiss today. My sort of ending time, I'd love for you to grab your bags. I'm going to ask you if you to come, you come central into the room. And I'm going, to, I'm going to pray over you guys, invite our church to pray with me over you guys. So come on, let's go. Come on. And then after I finish... Garrett's going to come up and dismiss you guys with our blessing, but I'd love for if you would all today, if y'all could just extend your hands this way to these folks, and uh, let's pray over these young men and women. Can we do that together? Lord Jesus, our hearts are, are greatly blessed today, one, because of the accomplishments of these young men and women. And how you've raised them up to to reach out and strive for the best to be able to excel in their education. Many of them, and even way beyond that in athletics and and other efforts with farming and other things. Father, we're just so grateful for the way they have expressed their their life and their, 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 their commitment. And I just pray today that as they walk out in this world... Those of us who've been around a year or two know that this world is a, not a friendly place most of the time. And I just pray that in the midst of the journey that's ahead of them, that God, you would find a way to come alongside them. The scripture talks about the paraclete, the spirit that comes alongside of us. And I pray that you might be real to them, that you might come alongside them to encourage them, to strengthen them, 
to convict them and direct their paths and all the other things that your spirit does. But God, today we simply pray that you might do your best work in their lives. I know, God, I know every one of these young men that you, young men and women, have, you have a, a goal, a plan, a destiny for them that's far greater than their greatest imagination at this point. But that'll never be lived out in their lives fully unless they walk with you. So I pray that you would help them to walk with you in the days and weeks, months and years to come that they might be able to see not only your goodness and grace, but your sufficiency in every area of their life. We pray for protection. I pray for that you'd bring people into their life that would help them along their journey of faith, that you'd keep people away from their lives that would seek to deter them and distract them and destroy them. We commit that all to you today because we love these young men and women. And we pray today, knowing that you love them even more than we can ever think about. We simply commit them to you today, asking you to do your best work in their lives, in the days, weeks, years to come. And today we'll choose to say thank you for all that you've done and will do in their lives. And we bless you for that in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen.